Okay, so we've been looking at uh, binary cyclic codes. Okay, and uh, I was trying to tell you about this uh, ring Rn, which is the sort of all polynomials. Binary coefficients, addition and multiplication, this T rule modulo x bar n plus 1. Okay, let me ask you a related question. Let's see if somebody gives me an answer. So we saw that this is a ring. Okay, is this a field? Yes or no? So there's one person saying no, anybody else saying yes? Yeah, so the only field you can get out of this is the binary field 0, 1. Once it becomes n becomes greater than or equal to 2, x star n plus 1 can be factored. Okay, so what does it mean when x star n plus 1 is factored? There will be some element inside which will not have an inverse. Okay, so it's not possible. So clearly, this is not irreducible, so it will not be a field, it, it's a ring. Okay, but it's definitely a ring and we can check that. And I said, uh, I defined something called ideals. So an ideal I of Rn is what we saw, what we saw, I think this needs proof, I am just writing it down. Ideal I of Rn is the cyclic code. Okay, so what is the cyclic code definition? If C0, C1, Cn minus 1 is in the code, then that implies what is also in the code. Cn minus 1, C0, Cn minus 2 is also in the code. That is the definition for a cyclic code. What is the definition for an ideal? Okay, so it's a subspace. Ideal is a subspace of Rn. And then what else should be true? A of x is in the ideal. And then B of x is in R. Rn, what should be true? What implies B of x times A of x should be in, in the ideal. Okay. So that is, this is the these are the two properties that define the ideal here and we saw, and we saw that the cyclic code of length n is the exact same thing as an ideal of r. Okay, so this is true always. Okay. And then we saw some powerful properties for this ring r n. It, it happens to be what is known as a principal ideal domain. So every ideal here is a principal ideal. Okay, so as in just like the integers are a principal ideal domain, when you have an ideal, it is always generated as a multiple of some number. Okay, so likewise here, Every ideal here is always generated as all possible multiples of one polynomial. Okay? In fact, that one polynomial is not necessarily unique. There are several polynomials you can come up with whose multiplications will give you this. Okay? So that's a bit different from the integer case where it's unique. So, but one specific generator polynomial is that polynomial of minimal degree in the ideal. Okay? So that one has a lot of powerful properties. Okay? So that is called the generator polynomial. Okay? So the generator polynomial. Okay, minimal degree polynomial in I. Okay, so like I said, the first thing we showed was this polynomial is unique. Okay, what what happens if it's not unique? How do you prove that? Uh, take two of them and then add them. You'll get a strictly lesser degree polynomial, which violates the minimality of our original lesson. Okay, so it has to be unique. Then what else did we show? Every code word or every element of the ideal is a multiple of, well, every code word, the so gfx divides, okay, so this minimal degree polynomial we call gfx, the unique one, okay, the gfx divides every polynomial in i over what? Over fx, okay, so over the f2x, okay, over the binary field, okay, so you do not have to do any modular x bar n plus 1 to make it divide, you just divide, there okay, is no problem, okay. Then we showed gfx also divides divides what? x power n plus 1. Okay. So that is very nice. Okay. So the final, final thing gives us a very firm handle on all possible cyclic codes. Okay. Suppose I want to list out all possible cyclic codes of length n. What should I do? Okay. So I know g of x divides every c of x and i 
when happens to one of two of us provides x bar and plus one. Okay, so this property is crucial in tabulating all possible cyclic codes of length n. Okay, so it's very easy now. Okay, so I know how to factor x bar n plus one. How do I factor x bar n plus one? I have to find then order n element of some finite field. Okay, and that that and all its powers will be fact. Uh, roots of x bar n plus 1, all the n roots. So, it factors into linear uh, linear factors in that field. Okay, and then what do you do? How do you get binary factors? You just group this if you want to it together and you get the binary uh, coefficient factors. So, you factor x bar n plus 1 into a product of the reducibles over f 2 x. Once you do that, all possible g of x can easily be identified. So you just take all possible factors of x bar n plus 1. From there, you get all possible cyclic codes. Okay? Another interesting point here is n minus k. Okay, so if you have an n k cyclic code, n minus k equals what? Degree of g of x. Okay, so that just comes from the property that g of x has to divide every possible code word here. The code word has to have degree n minus 1. So if g of x has some degree d, then you can have n minus that many code words. To that will be the dimension of the code. Okay, so this is another factor that's interesting. Okay, so we saw this before even for the BCH case, right? So the BCH case also we got some result like that. That's a special case of this. Okay, so I know this is Shastra week or whatever, you might be totally distracted by various things. I don't know if you saw, if you had time to go back and look at this or think about this. Is there any question on this stuff? Seems okay. Simple enough. Okay. All right. So, so that's the generator polynomial. So one nice thing about this is that it gives us a good generator matrix. Okay, so you can find a generator matrix quite easily. How do you find the generator matrix? You can take a matrix G, which has to be k cross n, right? In the first row, I will put G of x. Okay, so what do I mean by putting G of x in the first row? Okay, see, so G of x is going to be some. Okay, you can show that we cannot have anything other than 1, 1 plus g1x plus 4 on 2, x bar n minus k, right? Okay, so that will be the form of uh, g of x. Okay, why can't this be 1? So why should this be 1? Why can't it be 0? Yeah. That should divide x bar n plus 1. If it is 0, there is no way it will divide x bar n. Okay, so that has to be 1. Okay, so when you put g of x here, what do I do there? 1, g1 g2, so on to gn minus k, which would be 1, followed by whole bunch of 0. The next row, what would I put? x times g of x. All the x times g of x? g of x shifted right by 1. So, likewise, you go all the way down to x bar, sorry, k minus 1 times g of x. That will be the last row. So, that gives you a k cross n generator matrix for a cyclic code. Okay, so this is a nice uh, binary generator matrix. You can do this for the BCH code also. Okay, so that gives you the x. Okay. All right. So that's the that's the generator matrix. And uh, generator generator polynomial plays a crucial role here. Okay, how do you know that the rank of this matrix will be k? This is a diagonal path with one there, so clearly the k okay, rows have to be linearly dependent, right? So this, this we take this guy here, it will all be one. One, 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 one. Okay? And that part clearly is going to have rank k, you cannot have rank less than So that's fine. Okay, so there are a lot of other questions you can ask. So what about the binary parity check matrix? Okay, so one way of answering that is to say you take the generator matrix, do Gaussian elimination, you get a nice and then you the, use the IP, P transpose, I formula to get the parity check matrix. One can do that, that's no problem, but then it doesn't seem very nice, okay? it doesn't give you any ideas on where this is coming from. So for that, we will use something called the parity check polynomial. Okay? Just like a generator polynomial, there is something called the parity check polynomial. Basically, is is defined as follows. So H of x is defined to be. Okay, so this symbol basically means I'm defining H of x to be something. X bar n plus one divided by g of x. Okay, 
I know GFX divides x bar and plus 1. So, I do the division. I will get h of x. So, h of gfx has degree n minus k. So, what will be the degree of h k h of x? What will be the degree? x bar k, right? So, it will be h k minus 1 x bar k minus 1 plus x bar k, okay? So, I know for sure that this h0 will also be 1 and h k will also be 1. How do I know that? So it's very easy. So x, g of x times h of x has to be equal to x bar n plus one. So you equate the coefficients on of the power of x bar n and equate the coefficient in the constant term. You'll get that these two guys have to be one. Okay, so it's very easy to do that. So these two have to be one. So this will be the form of h of x. The middle things I don't know. Okay, some of them will be non-zero. Some of them will be zero. It depends on g of x. Okay, so that we can't control. The other things we can do. Okay. Now the claim is the claim is the following. We can easily prove this. So if we have a c of x in the code implies, in fact it also implied by c of x times x of x equal to 0 in Rn. Okay. This is not 0 in f 2 x, it is 0 in Rn. What does that mean? c of x times h of x is 0 in Rn. What does that mean? In f 2 x what does it mean? Yeah, x bar n plus 1 divides c of x times h of x. That is a trivial kind of statement. Why, why is it trivial? c of x is already a power multiple of g of x. Okay, c of x is some m of x times g of x. What is g of x times h of x? x bar n plus 1. So, clearly it is a very trivial thing. The other way also is true. I mean, if you think about it for a while and write it down, you will see the other way. Okay, so, if you have c of x times h of x equal to 0 in Rn, then it also implies that c of x. So, x bar n plus 1 has to divide this and some, some part of it will go into h of x. The remaining part has to go into g of x. So, c of x. It can't do anything else. Okay, so, that's it. That is the claim. And the proof will skip. It's easy to see. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is c of x is what? C is equal to plus c one x plus c n minus one x bar n minus one. And h of x, let's write it in general form from zero plus h one x is to until h k x bar k. This is zero n R n. Okay. So let me do the multiplication in R n. Multiplication in R n is very easy. How do you do multiplication in R n? You don't have to do any major division and all. Simply set x bar n to be 1. Okay. Anytime you get a power greater than x bar n, you reduce it by that much. If you have x bar n plus 1, what does it become? x. x bar n plus 2, it becomes x squared. Okay. So, you do a multiplication in Rn and try to get the coefficients from, let us say, x bar 0 to x bar n minus 1. Okay. So, x bar, I think uh, what I should get is x bar n minus k minus 1. Okay. So, only those things will be meaningful after that will not be meaningful. We will see that. Okay. So let us write it down. So let us write down the coefficient of x bar 0. What is the coefficient of x bar 0 here? Let me see who gets it right. What will be the first term? C0 is 0. Is that it? That is it. Be careful. Okay. <laughs> what else will you get? Yes. So exactly. So you, have, you can do h1 times C n minus 1. That will also give me a constant term, right? This may x bar n, okay? And then h2 times c n minus 2 all the way to what? h k times c n minus k. Is it okay? Alright. So, so, so x bar 0 is a bit uh, confusing. So, maybe let us start with x bar 1. Okay. So, if you do x bar 1, what do you get? Okay. So, maybe I should maintain the multiplication so to help us. Okay. So, let us do the Keep what we are trying to do. Okay, so let us uh, keep that guy short. So, suppose I say x power 1, what happens to x power 1? I think this is slightly nicer. Let me see. Oh, maybe maybe I should do something else. Okay, so let me let me start with x power n, n minus 1. I think this is better. Yeah, so x power n minus 1. What is the coefficient of x power n minus 1? H0 times Cn minus 1 plus H1 times Cn minus 2. Okay, we do not get any crazy kind of situation if you do n minus 1. So you go all the way down to Hk times C n minus k. So okay. Right? This will have to be equal to 0, right? So this is 0 in Rn. So clearly I am doing the multiplication in Rn, so every possible coefficient should go to 0. Okay. 
What about x bar n minus 2? x0 times cn minus 2 plus h1 times cn minus 3 all the way down to hk times cn minus 2 minus 1. Okay, so, you, you see you see what is happening. Sorry, n minus k. There should be a minus 1 here. Okay. Minus 2 here. Is it okay? All right. So, so you can see what is happening here. h0 to hk is kind of remaining the same. Initially, you are multiplying from C n minus 1 to C n minus k minus 1, and then the next step I am multiplying from C n minus 2 all the way to C n minus k minus 2. Okay, so I want to go all the way down to, let us say, uh, I will go down to x bar k. So, I do x bar k, so the right thing. So, I have n minus k of them, right? No, you do not like it. Is it okay? What is the problem? Okay. So, what is x bar k? H0 times C K plus H1 times C K minus 1 all the way to H K times C0 0. Okay. So you have n minus k equations, right? N minus n minus k is k. So you have 1 to n minus k. The reason why I am looking for n minus k equations is when you apply the check matrix, you will have n minus k linearly different condition. So, what I am going to do is I am going to write this in matrix form. Okay. So, let us write this in matrix form in a particular way. Okay. So, I want an n minus k cross n matrix so that h times c transpose will be equal to 0. Okay. So, I am going to put c here this way. Is that okay? So, how should I put the c? I should start with c0, c1, now go all the way down to cn minus 1. Okay, this is my multiplication. I am writing it just to aid my writing down. So, what should be the first row? Oh, must see n minus 1 gets multiplied by h naught. So, I should have h naught on the rightmost side. Then, where should h1 be? To its left, right? So, h1 all the way down to hk. Is that okay? What will be the next row? So, here we will have 0. What will be the next row? So, this will be 0 and h naught, h1 all the way to h. Is that okay? So, you have shifted it left over. I am keeping c is the same. I am moving this to the left. So, all the way down to hk coming here. H0, 0. Okay? Is that clear? So, the same equations have written it in a matrix form. Okay? Now, this is an n minus k cross n matrix such that h times c transpose is 0 for every single code word in my code. So, what kind of a matrix is this? It is a pi check matrix. How do I know that the rank is equal to n minus k? Uh, you can see that h0 and hk are 1 and you have clearly some big time triangular matrices on both sides. So, there is no way the rank is going to be less than n minus k. Okay? So, rank is equal to n minus k. So, this picks up valid pi check matrix. Okay? So, we will start our notation for this also. There is one, one confusing part is the, the first row is the mirror image of HFX. So it would be nice to have HFX itself, but it is not quite HFX. It is the mirror image of HFX. Okay? So, let me call H of X as X power K or let me just say X power degree of HFX. Okay? X power degree of HFX times h of x inverse. What does that do? What does that do? It does the flip. Okay, so, if you have h0 plus h1x plus h2x square all the way to hk x bar k, this operation will give you hk plus hk minus 1x plus hk minus 2x square all the way to h0 x bar k. Okay? And then I can write this parity check matrix in a nice form like this. So, in the first row I can put the last row here just to make it look similar to my generator matrix. So, what is the first row? H power of x. Am I right? What is the next row? What is the next row? X times H power of x. Okay. All the way down to what is the last row? X power n minus k minus 1 H power of x. 
aha this is the parity check matrix of my cyclic code with generator matrix g of x but it also looks very much like a generator matrix of cyclic codes that we had before okay except that the only thing we are not sure of is whether h prop of x divides x bar n plus 1 will let h prop of x divide x bar n plus 1 Yes or no? Yes. Yes. How do you show that? Okay. So you say so. So basically, you can also show h prop of x will divide. So what's my claim? My claim is. Prop of x will divide x bar n plus one. It's true. It's true that it will happen. How do you show this? Proof is quite easy. Okay, so you can kind of follow the argument that he said, or you can just look at x bar n plus one is g of x times h of x. Okay. Now do the reversal operation on this equation. Okay. What will you get if you do the reversal operation here? By x bar n. C. B. Okay. X bar n plus one is x bar n times g of x plus one h of x. Oh no! Do the reversal operation on the left-hand side. Don't do anything else. What should you do? X bar degree of the left-hand side. What is the degree of left-hand side? N. Instead of x, you put x inverse. So you get x bar minus n plus one. Then you multiply by x bar n. What will you get? You should get the same thing. This is like we say the symmetric polynomial, right? So when you do reversal on a symmetric polynomial, you get the same. Thing, okay? So when you do reversal, you get x bar n. So here, if I do reversal, I have to do. X bar n times I know the degree of this is also n, right? X bar n times g of x inverse h of x inverse. So how can I distribute this x of n? Put n minus k for g of x inverse and put x bar k for for h of x inverse. So what is this guy? This guy is the reversal of g of x. This guy is the reversal of h of x, which is h bar of x. Clearly, h bar of x divides. X bar n minus n plus one. Okay, so this H bar of x is a valid generator polynomial for a cyclic code of degree n. Okay, it divides X bar n plus one, so you can generate an ideal with it and it will be a proper cyclic code. There's no problem. Okay, so so what we have shown by looking at the parity check matrix carefully is the dual of a cyclic code. Remember, what is the dual of a code? It's the code for which this guy is the generator matrix. So the dual of a cyclic code is also a cyclic code with generator matrix given by this H bar of x. Okay, so that's what we show. Okay, so that's the final result. Dual of cyclic code is also cyclic. If this case is generated by G of x. This guy is generated by dual is generated by h prop of x. How do you find h prop of x? We first find h of x. First find h of x, and then do what? H prop of x is the reversal of that. H prop degree of h of x. Times h of x inverse. Is it okay? So, so anyway, I mean, so it's good that it's cyclic and all that, and it's, it's very nice. But one thing that that's very very nice is the outside itself is for cyclic codes, one can come up with a parity check matrix, binary parity check matrix, which is very very easy to describe. Okay. So what is so nice about it? It's, it's like I said, easy to describe. As in. This has got so many entries: n minus k cross n. If n is thousand, k is five hundred. You might think it's a big matrix, but then what should I do? I only have to describe the first row, right? I only describe the first row, and then you can quickly find. Okay, so parity check matrix is very nice, and like I said, the parity check matrix is used in several decodings and smart ideas and decoding. So, so it's good to know the parity check matrix in binary ones. You can do this for the BCH code also, right? You can do this for the BCH code, but then there is a slight confusion. If n equals order of beta, you can do it. Then is greater. What happens? We are getting a shortened code. For the shortened code, the generator matrix is easy. Parity check matrix is a bit more involved, right? It's not that easy when you shorten. It's, it's a little more more involved. You have to do that. Or you do not be systematic. Also, you have to just do it carefully.
Is that okay? So, so I think uh, this is all that I wanted to do about cyclic curves. I mean, I'm going to move on and show the connection between PCH and cyclic curves more expl explicitly next. Uh, I don't think we have to really look at uh, anything more besides this. Let me just think for a while. Do anything more? Okay, so maybe I should just write down some simple things. So if you're using cyclic curves, so uh, the encoding and these are some general principles which are, which are quite useful. Encoding and error detection are very easy to implement. Okay, so that's the first thing that you might you might want to take from in case. I want to know all the equations just to know the final big picture view. Encoding and error detection are easy. Why is encoding easy? How can you do encoding? You simply do it. MFX times GFX. So in case you want systematic encoding, what can you do? What is the systematic encoding? You do x bar n minus k times m of x, divide by GFX, takes the remainder, remainder and put it in. That is also very easy, just just register. Why is error detection easy? Sorry? Yeah, exactly. So you have to only do this multiplication. Okay, so this property is what makes error detection very, very easy. It okay, makes error detection easy. Okay, it's not enough to evaluate one row of the paradigmatic matrix. Okay, so you have to evaluate all the rows. But all the other rows are simply shifts of the first row. So you can do a very easy shift register kind of circuit. Then keep shifting it, shifting it, clocking out. If everything is zero, then it is a valid uh, valid code. Okay, otherwise it's not a valid code. So error detection and error correct encoding can be done very very easily. In fact, you can also do something else. Okay, very simple. Without doing any H of X, also you can do it. What can you do? Take the R of X, divide by G of X. Like I said, division is also something that can be very easily implemented. You divide by G of X and see if you get a reminder. Okay, so error detection. And simply do the opposite, which is divide by the effect, see if the mind is zero. So, to get division, there is a very standard uh, 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 LSSR kind of circuit that is available, one can do it very easily. Okay, so, you divide by GFX, here you kind of multiply by GFX, this case is getting on my nerves, this is very major work is going on upstairs and you are just doing it at all times. Okay, so you multiply and you divide the G of X on the other side. Okay, so couple of things are not really addressed explicitly. One is how do you construct a cyclic code with a guaranteed minimum distance? Okay, so I have not done that very explicitly. The other thing is how to do decoding. Okay, so of course you can do syndrome detection, it's no problem, but then it's, it's it becomes hard like we motivated before. A nice solution for both of those problems is the BCH code. Okay, so BCH codes are cyclic codes which have good encoding, good error detection as guaranteed for any cyclic code. On top of that, you have guaranteed error correction capability. We also have simple algebraic implementations of the decode. Okay. So for both of those, decode, encode, the error, guaranteed error, error, error correcting capability, guaranteed minimum distance and ease of algebraic decoding, you have to pick the GFX very carefully. Okay. So that is where this notion of zero for the cyclic code comes in. Zeros of a cyclic code are basically what? Proofs of zero. Okay, so these are called zeros of the cyclic code. Okay. So what is so special about the zeros of the BCH code? Okay. So if you look at the example, what is so special about zeros of BCH code? Okay. What is so special about the zeros of the here correcting BCH code. What are the zeros? Okay. So if you have beta as the value of field element, you would get what? Beta to beta square, beta power 3, so on to beta power 2t. Okay. So the zeros, the powers of beta that are zeros of the BCH code come in what is called an arithmetic progression or a very simple progression in this case, just 1, 2, 3. They are consecutive. Okay. You have 2t consecutive powers of beta as roots of the BCH code. And if you go back and look at the derivation of the minimum distance, the fact that these were the powers of beta and they were consecutive, 
both are very very crucial powers of beta of course it has to be power of beta but the fact that they were considered without any break in the middle was used very very strongly in the proof if you go back we went back to the van der Waals matrix right and the van der Waals matrix works only when you have considered the power yeah otherwise it will not work okay so that's the that's the crucial idea here and then you can also go back and look at our algebraic decoder okay our algebraic decoder will not work if you did not have considerable powers okay so at least maybe i didn't show you all the simplifications but the belly camp iterative method all these things will not work that easily if you did not have considerable powers as zeros okay so having consecutive powers of beta as zeros is the crucial idea in the construction of these things okay you can extend this a little bit in fact you can say i don't want beta beta square beta by 3 i can in fact start at some b okay it can be b plus 1 b plus 2 b plus 3 all the way to b plus 2 okay. so some b okay that way i said you know i will necessarily start at one so now if you have any two t consecutive sets of zeros okay so if you start at b equal to 1 it is called at b equal to 0 i'm sorry if you put b equal to 0 it is called a narrow sense bch code it's just terminology it's jargon it's completely unnecessary but usually people pick b equal to 0 so it becomes something called narrow sense uh, bch code there's also other terminology which is relevant to us but the crucial idea i want to emphasize is if zeros are consecutive in fact for generalization here for the consecutive also you can also have a ap with common difference being relatively prime to the order of beta okay, so you can do that also that also will give you the same thing zero is consecutive implies guaranteed minimum distance it also gives you implementable algebraic decoder uh, bounded distance right so bounded distance is important if you don't do bounded distance i think we will So that's the crucial connection between cyclic codes and BCH codes. So initially, I think cyclic codes were studied in great depth, hoping that there'll be a lot of other codes which are not necessarily consecutive, or maybe they are building blocks for so many other codes. And people are doing it with a lot of enthusiasm, but as it has turned out, many people have shown that it will not really work. Okay, so you know, when you run up, if you want to get the capacity or things like that, as we'll see in the next course, cyclic codes are not that useful. Okay, so today I would say not many people are looking at cyclic codes very seriously. Except in some storage context, in storage context there are some more interesting ideas that are needed. Okay, so that's the cyclic codes idea. And uh, the next thing I wanted to say, okay, so let me just uh, do the BCH code connection more precisely and give some examples, point out some of these things. Okay. So if you look at the construction of the BC code, okay, so you have to take n equal to half of beta. Okay, so I did this before. Also. I showed the cyclic property, right? So you can see clearly it has to be. Uh, you have you, so, so, so once you pick n equal to half of beta, BC code becomes cyclic. So this is one of the properties I proved, right? Just based on the definition. Okay, BC is cyclic. So that is the main connection. Okay, so let's take some explicit examples. Just for fun, okay. So you pick n equals order of beta, and then let's say you pick uh, t equals one. Okay. What happens if you pick t equals one? The parity check matrix of just one row, right? One beta, beta square, and the way to beta power and minus one. Okay. Okay. A very common example is to pick n to be equal to two power m minus one. Okay. So what happens if we set n to be equal to two power n minus one? How can you pick beta if n is equal to two power n minus one? Yeah. So you just simply take set beta to be the element of G of two power n, and it is primitive. Okay. So a BCH code with n equals two power n minus one is called the primitive BCH code. Okay. So what? Codes we've been looking at are basically called primitive narrow sense BCH codes. Narrow sense because we pick b to be equal to zero, and then primitive because we, we pick n to be equal to two bar m minus one. That's that's the special case we are looking at. Okay, so these things are not necessary in general, but special case is there. Okay, so if you do that, okay, what kind of a code is this T equals one error correcting BCH code? 
we already we know it by some other name also can anybody identify that if I put n equals 2 power n minus 1 I have a t equals 1 which is d equals 3 code what kind of a code is that the Hamming code okay so this is also the Hamming code so you get what's called the Hamming code okay so you might say I described it differently right so how did I describe the Hamming code I said each column has to have n bits I picked all the non-zero m bit vectors put one after the other you get such a code okay, am I doing the same thing here okay, I am doing the same thing here right so you remember each beta is also has a vector notation which is m bits and now I have all the possible distinct m bit vectors but they appear in a certain order okay what is nice about this order is in this order the code is sitting okay right so Hamming code is the same code is cyclic in that order what do you mean by order why is the order suddenly important now see if I pick my m bit vectors in the natural order 1 2 3 so on it will not fit this if it does not fit this then the code is not cyclic I have permuted my code words right so it will not be cyclic anymore I have no guarantees like that but if I pick my m bit vectors in this order suggested by 1 beta beta square not only do I get a Hamming code but I get a Hamming code in the cyclic form okay so let us see one, one specific example here okay so, so let, let, before I move to the example what is the generator polynomial for this Hamming code it is the minimal polynomial of what of beta right so it is the minimal polynomial of beta of x is that okay right how do I know that this is the smallest degree polynomial in my code? Right, from the cyclic code side, you see the Hamming code. I basically, so the BCH code, I basically defined this to be the generator matrix. And now that we generate a polynomial, but we know now more properties of the generator polynomial. We know that generator polynomial is the polynomial of least degree in the cyclic code. How do I know that this m beta of x is the least degree polynomial in my cyclic code? Yeah, it is it's, it's the minimal polynomial. Right? That is the definition polynomial with binary coefficients it has beta as its root right so of course m beta of x has to be the minimal degree polynomial nothing else can happen okay now you can also go back and see my arbitrary definition was the theory of course I will come back to that but let us let's, let's keep this in mind and let us do a one explicit example we will pick m equals 3 equals n equals 7 and beta n g of 8 perimeter okay so if you do if you do the Hamming code, okay, you might pick the parity check matrix in the natural order, which is 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, Okay, if you list out the code words of this code defined by this parity check matrix, it will not be cyclic. Okay, you will see that the, there will be some code words whose cyclic right shift will not be in the code. Okay, so this is not cyclic. Okay. How do I make it cyclic? I have to define it in the order suggested by beta. Okay. So for that, we have to pick uh, beta bar 3 plus 1 plus beta and then list out the elements of GFA. So I get 0, 1, beta, beta squared, which is okay, beta bar 3, which is 1 plus beta. Okay. So let me write down the vector notation. This is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1 then beta plus 4 is what? beta star plus beta b110 then beta plus 5 is beta star plus beta plus 1 is that right? 111 and then beta plus 6 is 1 plus beta star 101 ok so if I put my parity set matrix in the order of beta so the first thing should be 1 next thing should be beta which is 0 1 0 next thing should be beta squared which is 1 0 0 ok already we are seeing a difference in the order here 1 0 0 and then what beta part 3 which is 0 1 1 am I right beta part 4 which is 1 1 0 beta part 5 is 1 1 1 and beta part 6 is 1 0 1 if I put it in this order it becomes cyclic ok you can generate all the 16 code words of this code you will see it this cyclic so that is a nice thing to remember about the Hamming code in this particular order in which you pick the columns 
you can make it cyclic and that's suggested by the powers of beta. Okay, and what is the generator polynomial now for this? x bar 3 plus x plus 1. Okay, so not only do I know it's cyclic, I know that every code word is generated by multiple of x bar 3 plus x plus 1, only in this form. If it is not in this form, I don't know that. Okay, so this is nice about the Hamming code. Okay, so let us go to the arbitrary case. So if you look at the PA the correct PCH code, okay. I gave you the definition for the generator polynomial. What was it? Basically, the LCM of m beta of x, m beta square of x, all go to 1 beta power 2 p of x. Does that make sense now in light of our new definition of cyclic codes? Okay. Now, to go to the BCH code, I am looking for the least degree polynomial, which is an element of the code. Okay. I know beta, beta square, all the way to beta power 2 p are roots of my code word. So, on the least degree one, LCM of the product, LCM of these minimal polynomials has to be the answer. Okay. So, you see that is how we define the generator polynomial. The generator polynomial definition I gave before makes sense as a cyclic code. Okay. So, that is why all the code words are generated as multiples of g of x, everything works out properly. Okay. I did it kind of in reverse, but when you do the cyclic codes later, you see that there is a unity between these two codes. Okay. The point, the reason why I did the matrix first is, what is most critical about the BCH code is the fact that it can be decoded very easily. Okay. And that comes just from that matrix and the consecutive powers. It's got nothing to do with cyclic. Okay. The cyclic part is nice, it's good, it ties up everything together. But in practice, the decoder comes really from the consecutive roots. It's got not much to do with the cyclic matrix. Okay. Okay. So that's the that's the theory correcting BCH code. And uh, I think that is pretty much all I wanted to say about BCH codes. There are there are there is lots of work that was done in the 60s and 70s to flesh it out. So, this almost most of the problems are uh, well understood in BCH codes in a way. I mean, understood in a sense, people know either that, whether it can be solved or not. Okay. So those problems that cannot be solved, nobody looks at. So, for instance, one of the problems is if somebody gives you an arbitrary cyclic code, let us say, says, this is my G of X, okay, you do not pick powers consecutively or anything like this, some arbitrary g of x. Okay. Can you compute anything about, compute the minimum distance for instance. Okay. So, those are considered difficult problems, nobody tries to solve. So, what is interesting in my opinion even today is, can you correct more than TRFs? Okay. What guarantees can you give? So, okay, of course, you can come up with some decoder which maybe will correct TRF, more than TRF once in a while, but can you give any guarantees? Can you say that like 50 percent of the weight t plus 1 errors can be corrected. If at all it is possible, I do not know if it is possible or not, but if it is possible, such a fraction of t plus 1 errors can be corrected. Can you come up with a decoder like that? That would be something which is still open I and mean, people are still interested in it also. Okay? But like I said in the DVB, the digital video broadcasting standards, BCH codes are used and if you can come up with a practical algorithm which can decode more than t errors, it is great. Okay? But Go back to our algebraic decoder and see that correcting TRS was all that is possible, right? So we use the 2D syndromes to correct TRS. If you have to correct T plus 1 errors, there is no way you correct all of them. Okay? And it turns out for getting close to capacity and doing very well, you do not have to correct all of them. Okay? That is the interesting part. Okay? So because most channels are statistic, it is not like T plus 1 errors, the worst possible thing will happen all the time. Okay? So most of the time things will be okay. Even if there are T plus 1 errors, most of the time it might help you. Okay? So, it might be in a way in which it is favorable to you. So, then what you need is, I have to say out of all the t plus 1 errors, I can correct a sufficient fraction of it. Out of all t plus 2 errors, I can correct a sufficient fraction. Maybe even all the 2 t errors. Okay? So, you should be able to correct larger and larger error patterns, but not all of them. There is no way you can correct all of them, but a sufficiently high percentage of them. If you can correct them, then it turns out you can give very good performance guarantees and you can get close to capacity. You can do all these kind of fantastic things which modern codes are able to do and modern codes do not even have a guaranteed minimum distance. Okay. So, that is the interesting uh, counterpart to this. Okay. So, you have a guaranteed minimum distance, you can correct up to the error capability, but then what? You cannot correct anything beyond it. That is a very bad statement to make. Okay. So, it turns out what is interesting in practice today is either modify the code construction or modify the decoder so that you can correct large fractions of errors beyond the error correcting capability. Okay. So, some of the projects that people might sign up for, I do not know, 
or about that. For instance, the chase decoding algorithm is about that. How can you correct beyond error correcting capability? And there's also one more algorithm which is better. Okay. What can you do to go beyond error correcting capability in this uh, decoder? Okay. And that is still of interest today in practice. Okay. And of course, I mean, we don't have the time to look at it, but maybe if the, one of the persons is doing the project when they make a presentation, you can remember this idea. Okay. Another idea which is very important is this notion of soft decoder. So like I said, decoders beyond error correcting capability, these are open and interesting issues. As of today, it might change, it might change later on, you know, these things, the point of uh, these things is, uh, things change. I mean, today some things have interest, tomorrow something else is of interest. Okay, so if you don't do these things properly, then you will, you will not be able to manage those changes also. So it's good to know that. Okay, decoders beyond not to guarantee full error correcting error, of course it's not possible, can I correct a large fraction of errors beyond two? okay, so is that possible, that's, that's an interesting question which will open. The next idea is this notion of a soft decoder, okay, so this has become very very important today, okay. So, so far our decoder model was very very simple, we said for every bit that you put into the channel, how many bits do you get out? In our channel model, if you remember, I had, I write down C, and then I say plus E and then I write down R. Okay, so in this there is one implicit assumption. What is that assumption? For every bit that I put into the channel, I get only one bit out. Okay, so such such models are called hard decision models. Okay. Decoders you build from them are called hard decision decoders. Okay. Today, given our advancement and signal processing and all that, this bad situation is no longer true. Okay. For every bit that you put in, you can get definitely more than one bit let us say 8 bits are possible. Okay, so, what do you mean by saying 8 bits? Okay, so, you have to know a little bit of digital communication here. In the next course, I will talk more about it, but if you are doing digital communication now or you have done it in the past, you will know what I mean. Okay. So, these bits anyway get converted into some signal vectors. Right? The signal vector has a vector space, signal space notation. So, you can write the signal vectors in some say 2 dimensional space or 1 dimensional space or something like that. So, they are coordinates. Okay. So, these coordinates one can think of them as having, so the, the noise gets added to these coordinates. Okay, so, you are transmitting a vector coordinate, noise gets added to these coordinates and you can have more than one bit accuracy in your A to D converter with the receiver. Okay, so, suppose you send, so this code word bit 0 or 1 gets mapped into plus 1 or minus 1 in some signal space notation. Okay, some signal vector or it is minus 1 multiple, okay, so some, something like that. Okay, so, minus 1 and plus 1 is actually what is being transmitted. So, the noise will add as let us say a real number to this minus 1 and plus 1. Okay. So, what you get at the receiver can be thought of as a signal which has a lot of data in it. Okay. You do not have to quantize it to 1 bit, you can quantize it to 8 bits. Okay. Minus 1 plus 1, okay. noise gets added, so you get the entire range let us say minus 10 to plus 10. You do not have to quantize minus 10 to plus 10 in just 1 bit. Say it is very greater than 0, it is 0 to 10, less than 0 is minus 10 to 10. You do not have to do that. You can do say 8 bit quantization of minus 10 to 10. Okay, so, you get 8 bits of information for each bit you put into the channel. Now, can your decoder use those 8 bits? If it can use those 8 bits, you get what is called a soft decoder. Okay? And the chase decoder is again another example of this. Okay? So, hopefully, I think three page you opted for the chase decoder. So, when you do that, you will see how they are using these 8 bits or more bits of information. In fact, in loosely in theoretical models, you will assume that the received value is real okay, and then see how you use the real value in the decoder. Okay. In implementation, you have to either do floating point or fixed point, but, but eventually you can you can work it. Okay, and as a model, it is good. All right. So, these two are still very much open and interesting problems, in my opinion at least, on PCH codes. Okay, so, people will be interested in that. Okay. So, beyond this, there are uh, not too many interesting current open problems. Okay. So, this kind of brings us to the end of DCH codes and we are going to move towards Reed Solomon codes okay, that I will do in the next class and they are more interesting, they are much more widespread than DCH codes and finally, we will make a comparison between DCH and Reed Solomon codes. Okay, so, you will see there are some interesting comparison points between DCH codes and Reed Solomon codes. Okay, so, we will stop here for that.